Hey guys, it is Kim Tui here from Bell Vista Studios. I've got with me Divya here today. And well, Divya and I met last week actually, and she came to one of our meetups and we were chatting about, it was an ask me anything, teach me something theme. And I walked away with many things to Google after speaking with you. <laughs> so instead of doing a whole Google, cause when I Googled some of the stuff, like people like Tim Ferriss came up for accelerated learning. And then I was like, whoa, this is like, I'm going to get lost in the web of the internet. Uh, so I said, let's have a chat and you can educate me. And I can be curious about the things that you, you know, stirred in me the other night. So this is learning with Bell Vista Studios. And the new approach to the podcast is that basically we will be being curious and being learners with our guests and with each other within our team. Um, so yeah, basically the things that you brought up were very new to me. And so I just want to ask you about them and explore them with you to help me be better at what I do and hopefully add value to our community. So thank you for coming on and having a chat. <laughs> Kim, it's a pleasure that I'm here and uh, thank you for inviting me. It's always great to kind of learn with each other and grow in the community. So I'll be happy to share whatever I know and yeah. whatever themes you uh, you know would like to know more on, Yeah, uh, I can deep dive. <laughs> okay, okay, well give it a go because I think if you talk about the community there, I know one thing that you brought up was like communities of practice. So, and I know that you, so you worked at Citibank and basically it sounds like you've done a lot of proactive learning and learning and development initiatives and strategies there. So talk to me about the community of practice and facilitating that within a large organization. So, you know, uh, I worked in Citibank, I worked in Wipro and I worked in GSW Steels. These are different sectors, but I just realized that in this entire world, no one wants to go obsolete and everyone wants to develop skills. And how do we develop skills? One is that, you know, you go on web, you listen to stuff, you see videos and you can do a lot of stuff there, but it is all very external. A lot of times the real knowledge is between amongst all of us. Yeah. Like I worked in the last organization where there were like 600 plus people and everyone wanted to call themselves data scientists, which is so true because, you know, they were all in that space. Yeah. So do these people really need to go outside and learn from someone or can we have a community of practice where they're learning from each other yep. and being the best in the world, the world-class data science community. Yeah, wow. So, you know, what we thought is our vision is to ensure that we have that world-class community inside than outside and we are the one training the world and not the world training us. Of course, we take the best practices from there. Yep. So we define the capabilities that we want to learn. Either those capabilities are, you know, a bread and butter for us, like the BAU, or a forward compatible future ready skill. And, you know, when you talk about data science, there can be 10 things which come up. So we define close to 20 capabilities. We had 10 capabilities, which we wanted to go out in the market and learn. 20 we had inside. How did you define them? So you go to the leaders, you talk to them, you see the internet and you say that if today we are at position A and we want to move to position Z yeah. and be the best market leaders, what are those capabilities? And you know, you have the best talent, you know, 15, 20 years of direct experience with directors and all of them. Now they said that A, B, C, D, E, F, and till Z, all the capabilities were there. Then the point was which capability is more important? Yeah. Maybe narrow down to 20 capabilities. The next point is which capabilities among these 20 or 30 do we have internally? And if we have internal capabilities, who are the people who have yeah. these? And who are the ones who are at level one, two, three, four, five, level five, or maybe level three? Can we have those people together? And, and you know, it's easy to say that 20 capabilities, four people or five people, we're talking about 100 people out of 600 people in the community together, who are already at a very uh, high level capability and competency of that particular capability with level expert. Yeah. And now these expert people, 100 people are coming together and they're developing content. They are the ones who are looking at life projects, who are looking at uh, what's happening in the market. And believe it or not, all these 600 plus people, if you're talking about these 100 people, they're also getting a bit of visibility 
Yeah, course, so not? true. They are the content designers. So we then further develop them by sending them into accelerated learning style, you know, of, lead, of learning and development. They designed the content, they were the facilitators, and slowly whoever was joining City uh, and my other organizations, like in, in a form of uh, a lateral hire, we said, okay, we're hiring you for a particular skill. Would you like to join the community? Everyone started jumping in, and the community further developed and developed. I, as a learning partner, can only be a consultative partner for functional, but the community was so strong. We called it the Learning Council and then the Community of Practice for Equity Capability. And we moved on to doing close to 95% of the trainings internally. What? And 5% of course externally because, and by the way, these people were so good. 5% of the trainings which we, we went externally, it was hard to get the right vendors because they were so good in their knowledge. Wow. If the external person said, oh, I know I'm a data scientist, I can teach you X skill. They'd be like, okay, let me rub it off. Uh, <laughs> let me just see if you really have that or not. You're bluffing because you know what? I'm already at level three. <laughs> Yeah, wow. So then obviously, you know, there were people who were better and came and then next year the bit is, can we do it internally? Why do we go external? How did you get those people that were you identified as really good to get involved? Was it, did it become part of their role statement or, because I feel like that's, I've read it in books, but I've never seen it happen in organizations that I've worked with. Kim, that's a very interesting question. And that's something which is the biggest challenge to get the people involved, get their skin in the game, get their emotions in the game. Mm. And how did this happen? And that I think is the foundation. I love to share it now. Yeah, please do, <laughs> <laughs> definitely. So, um, you know, I, I would really give it to the leader of that uh, unit who, when I joined, was leading it and had a vision. And, uh, and I think sometimes those visionary leaders, when they let you be, instead of imposing stuff, it's really great. And that leader was brilliant. Yeah. What so, position did they hold? Were they the, the, in the executive yeah. or in the L&D team? No. So this leader was a business leader yeah. and was at our MD level, etc. You know. So when this leader said that, I will let you be, and but I want the foundation right. And I still remember the word foundation right. So that really means... Uh, we defined the skills, we defined everything, and we presented the entire proposition to the one down to the MD. And we said, you know what? Th these are the skills we want to do, and all of you have told me this. We need one member from your team. And if there were 10 one downs to the MD, 10 people in the community, we want all of them together. Yeah. But pick that one person who you think is the most passionate about learning. Yeah. Wow. And then they were like, oh, no, maybe I can think of. We got 10 people. Now, one of these people, uh, according to the leaders, were passionate about learning. I'll not say the intensity of passion was same. Okay. Like, you know, definition and intensity of passion can be very different. Yeah. But then getting them together will all well, meant that the MD will come and talk, share the vision, what we're trying to achieve, get them like really interested in an MD project, <laughs> yeah, giving wow. them a bit of visibility. Further, what these 10 people did was uh, we defined that level uh, level one, two, three for all the 20, 30 capabilities. That means if it is, like, for example, it's Python, what is level one knowledge and skill? Level two knowledge and skill, level three knowledge and skill. Now that was carved out, it was fine tuned, it was further frozen. That means whoever walks in for a level one program knows the content. Yeah. And whoever's coming in thinking that I want to, I'm, you know what, I'm level three. Okay, have you read the definition? Are you there? Yeah. Are you there yet? Or in your mind, you're level three, but in actual reality, you're not <laughs> level three. <laughs> yeah. So it made, made things very clear. Further, these 10 people, uh, we said that, okay, now from 20, 30 capabilities, why don't you pick the like, the ones you like? Yeah. You need not be the expert there. Remember, out of 600 people, we are talking about 10 people right now. They pick the capabilities. Some people have picked because they know it. Some people pick because they didn't know it and yeah. they want to know it. Wow. <laughs> and then we had basically 10 members picking 20, 30 capabilities. And we further classified like BAU capability, like forward compatible capability. And in that space, then we said, okay, now we, the brand ambassadors are there. Now we literally made like that marketing campaign to those 600 people. And we said, who wants to join us? Okay, by the way, are you level one, two, three or four? And then suddenly everyone started evaluating, where am I, where am I? And all the level three and four, the proposition for you to join is in 600 plus people, you think you were the best, but yeah. in reality, you're not the best. 
There's someone who's more knowledgeable than you in your skill. So someone's ahead of the game. So you got like, we further got in those 10 capabilities, close to three to four people each. So, you know, uh, actually 30 capabilities, three to four people, each, so close to 100 people. 90 people as trainers, 10 as the capability champions, and capability champions were designers, trainers, impact assessors, and we did a little bit of fancy names. Yeah. We said that as a learning and development advisor or as a functional trainer, what are you? You know? Yeah. So you are a marketer because you're marketing your stuff. Yeah. Right? You're a problem solver like an engineer. And uh, you, you, know, you are certainly in domain expertise. So what are you? Are you an impact assessor or are you a marketer or are you a you know, content designer or you're a facilitator? What are you yeah. beyond your regular SME roles? And slowly and slowly, all these 90 people, we identified the training needs from the 600 plus people, what they need. From there, we got to know which out of the 30 skills are more hotter and versus lukewarm versus cold. Yeah. And then we started planning trainings for the year. So close to 50 to 60 plus trainings a year. <laughs> and that number moved on because we moved from a headcount of about 600 to 800 and all of that. Yeah. So yeah, I think it was a very interesting journey. Uh, it will always happen that the passion in the beginning is much high. Yeah. But when you're doing your BAU work and you're doing all of this additionally, you know, you have your little bandwidth. So yeah. there will be times when out of the 10 people, few will go low, few will go high, and then low and then high. Yeah. And similarly, things will happen with the trainers. So to encourage and ensure that you're on a high state, you need to add additional talent. So in the recruitment process, in the you know, induction used to say, oh, do you want to join the learning community practice? And this will happen. Everyone wants to jump in. Yeah. So in a way, you're getting to know what the competition is doing in that space because you're getting people from outside. Yeah. Join the As company. you're recruiting them in, you get to learn. Yeah. Oh, wow. And then there's a retirement plan too. So not that everyone wants to be in the same space every time. Yeah. So uh, over a period of two, three years, these 10 members, the number remained 10, the faces changed. So people moved out and people moved in. Yeah, right. And in that process, we did have a bit of learning council who was the community and it was the, like the retired or alumni. And then they still continued to be with us in projects. Like we had mobility project where you move from function A to function B with trainings, with exposure of projects yeah. and all of that. So they started picking different projects. Impact framework of LMD is something which we worked on like a lot yeah. with our exact ROI of the money that we had invested in. So we expanded the community, but and we had retired members, alumni members, but yes, it just expanded. <laughs> How do you think um, you kept that longevity and the people coming in? Was it because if you're recruiting, they renewed energy, so people drop off and it's kind of happening like that? Like, how did it sustain over so much time? So uh, the reality is, in any team, I'm, you know, I kind of follow a couple of team management models and. Uh, the model says you have to have, first of all, the trust in the team, yeah. and then the goal, yeah. and then the commitment. And once the commitment is there, it's a high-performing team. But remember, it will never be high-performing forever. You need to renew it. right? So I do understand one person doing the same job for three and a half years, the passion will go low. Yeah. Right? Because everyone's fetching for something new. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's good to have a churn. It's, it's good to add new members. Uh, there were hardly one or two members who continued for three and a half years. And I know I've seen those steep down curves and then up curves. Yeah. The only way to sustain is to ensure that you recognize them, you reward them, you build in the trust again, you clarify the goal again, and the impact of the goal. So for example, in the entire year, I am a community of practice member for one capability. And I, tr I design content and I train five training programs a year and maybe training close to 20, 250 people. Yeah. Now, if I just do it, I was like, my role, I get bored. But doing the r and so we used to do an annual r and or quarterly r and and a monthly r and okay. Like the annual r and will be like, what did we achieve as a team? Yeah. And then the head and the managing director will come and, you know, there'll be good speeches and the trainer award. You know, sometimes we don't want to give too many awards because that means, oh, he was better than me and no one wants that. It's all yeah. voluntary work, right? But awarding them for what effort they have put in and what impact it's made. It's changed the life of, out of 800 people, everyone took like three functional training days, right? Wow. So 2,400 people you have impacted. And you know what? You have a brand because you, you're contributing here. 
and you're developing another skill of trainer. Like who knows in your career you want to eventually start a functional training company. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah, uh, all of that little bits really helped on. And of course you remember that came out of 600 to 800 people, only 100 were a part of it. So somewhere inside them, they wanted to learn with their peer group. Yeah. They wanted to get that branding of them. R and R. So they're they're R and R and what they've achieved, we'd put it on the TV screens across on the floor. So their photograph used to come in and they're like, okay. When you say R and R, what do you mean? Sorry, um rewarded recognition. Uh, yeah. No, I think isn't there there's something like a retreat and I don't know, it's relaxing or something when wow. you go on a retreat. So just clarifying if you're sending people off to relax for a while. I wish. Reward and recognition. Yeah, okay, that makes sense. I would love to go for a retreat, I think. It's uh, just good maybe to we should that. go after this. <laughs> I would love to. <laughs> um it's fascinating and it really is things that I've only like read in books about this and how it should be done is like yeah so well done if you were to do it again and when you do it next time in the next organization or if it is part of your project portfolio moving forward what would you do differently i think uh, there can be a lot of things which can be done differently i somehow feel there were a lot of wins there yeah but maybe top three things which i can think of now yeah First one, I would like the head, like who's heading the unit, like maybe the managing director or whatever in the next organization. Yeah. Maybe having those regular connects and sharing that, uh, how the, it's aligned to the vision and a bit more on the vision and then the effort. Yeah. So what's happening is everyone's doing beyond their work. Um, and do we really need to have that effort in place or do we cut down more on capabilities and maybe few skills? Yeah. So that means that less work, with more focus. I always believe less is more. Yeah. Uh, and I, I think I've started believing it more with my experience. So maybe less is more yeah. is something which with the business leader, something which I would like to do differently. Yeah. That's number one. Uh, number two, number two yeah, would be that a little more focused on after training journeys yeah. and then their impact. So that really means a lot of Again, focus on post-training with managers, like entire journey of what yeah. they would like to achieve from that particular person's training is always good to have because yeah. while we did the impact framework really well and I love to talk about it, but you know, this bit can always add value. Yeah. And the thing what I can do differently uh, with this community of practice is maybe use of augmented reality, virtual reality, wearables, <laughs> and then see, you know, in fact, I, I'm in the zone of writing an article and what I'm thinking of is about a wearable which says, what is my learning goal for the year? Ah. A wearable which says that, uh, you know what, I know you don't like reading books, but <laughs> I don't like reading too much. I like watching videos, I like listening to podcasts and a lot more in that space. So maybe learning, curated learning in that bite size module and you know, from the functional learning space, my functional trainers will have podcasts and videos and yep. you know, putting in there with the learning goal and you achieve it with with a with the thing. How will you implement this? So all of that in a very a uh, botics format yeah. is what I like to do yeah, differently. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. I like it. Well, thank you for sharing that story. If you think about the learning journey, what would you think would be a beneficial for something like that where you're talking about data scientists and the skills and the capability? Well, not necessarily data scientists, but Focusing on the capabilities that you guys had identified and were trying to impact, what would that learning journey look like if you had, a, had it as a bigger priority in the initiative? So uh, I think learning journeys for anyone, irrespective of the, the, you know, the unit they belong to, yeah. will never be only functional. Your learning journeys have to, and if you're joining a, a new person in the company, has to start with induction. It goes on to few core skills, functional skills, and maybe not immediately because you're getting hired for a particular skill, right? Yeah. You, know, you don't want to, oh, you got hired for X and let me train you in X again. Sorry, <laughs> I already have X. Yeah. So doing your core, training people for professional development, leadership, like emotional intelligence, like networking, building your brand, so many stuff which can come up based upon your need of the yeah. role and your personal development yeah. with the functional skill like together like a blend will have a learning journey now your learning journey 
can be part of education, going for training, certifications, etc. Uh, can be exposure, going for conferences, meeting people in meetups like you, yeah. <laughs> so, and connecting well and having, knowing what's happening in the market. Yeah. Uh, exposure of presenting to the managing directors, exposure of doing uh, you know, webinars, trainings, etc. Like training others. Like, yeah. yeah. And then the experience, like the hardcore work experience. So your learning journey will be from your individual development plan in the functional space, in the professional development and the leadership space. And naming a bit of what Triple E we used to call it, experience, exposure, education you have and what you really want to have to achieve that next level in your company or in, in, your, in your career journey, maybe it's starting something of yeah, your own, yeah. who knows. And if you have that thing clear, from that your learning journey will have experience, exposure, education and from there you will say have you achieved that learning goal and be there. So, so it's self-driven. It's always self-driven. You know, no matter whether it's a child or an adult, yeah. you cannot push people to learn. Yeah, that's very it's true. Like, you know, owning your development. It's, it's they have really... to want to do it. But who is that part of your like performance conversations? You know, but the I don't know the template or the framework allows for that discussion for the learning journey to be self-driven. Or are you guys as L and D, you know, sharing? You know, here's the seventy twenty ten model, and here's some things that you can do, such as shadowing or mentoring or higher duties or going to training. What's so it it is exactly seventy twenty ten. It's experience, exposure, and education. Yeah. <laughs> so education, hands on classroom or digital learning is only ten percent. Your experience is seventy percent, which is hands on. So you can say, you know job shadowing, whatever, you know, mentoring projects, etc. Yeah. 70, 20 is exposure, as I said, you know, going for conferences, presentations, cross-function yeah. projects, and 10% is education, which is hardcore training. It is always that model. How do you get someone to care about their own learning journey? It's, a, and I, I truly believe, Kim, l and professional has to be a brilliant marketer. If you're not a great marketer, I'm sorry you're not meant for this. Oh, wow, I <laughs> so, love this bold statement. So I think sales and HR and L&D all is together. It's very relevant. So, I totally agree with you. Yeah, because you know, it's about branding. It's about you know marketing your product. Yeah. So one of the values that you have to market is own your development or you know it's your learning journey. Hey, you don't want to go obsolete. Yeah, I don't want to be redundant. <laughs> so, <Yeah. laughs> so it's about owning you. And of course, we can help you. Yeah. But And I know that you might not have a learning goal, but you will have a performance goal. You might have a career goal. From that career goal, we can carve out the learning goal. And from the learning goal, it's about, you know, eventually have a wearable or AI or VI and all of that, which can be technological tools. But the core is identifying your learning goal. Yeah. And of course, you know, it's about you earning your money and not your manager earning his or her money. So you're, yeah. you you got to progress in your career and you have to own your career. Yeah. So you have to earn your learning too. <laughs> I, I really agree with it. I totally do. Do you have any tips then for other L&D professionals, how they can, you know, what things can they implement when we talk about marketing and branding yourself as an L&D practitioner or team or department within your organization? We've used a lot of techniques in marketing and branding, you know, while I'm sure a lot of us uh, might be using like creating those branding mailers and sending those with different taglines so that people don't delay, delete it with like, you know, two, three seconds of attention span, very, very fancy heading. So you click it with a cartoon picture, oh, that's funny. And then you read, yeah, it's, it's a yeah. training program. I know we all have practiced that. So I'll talk beyond this. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I think you can use a lot of game elements and yeah. we did that and there was a success story around it. We were seeing there a lot of uh, you know, digital training programs that you're kind of pushing based upon the skill requirement. People are not competing it. Honestly, it was hard for me to compete it as well. You know, I'm not yeah. denied it because with attention spans going so <laughs> low, it's very hard to go back. And very, very, you have to be very, very driven to do that. Yeah. So uh, we, we made like a bit of games, uh, like very simple, like game elements, leaderboard with game points, with all uh, you know business leaders' uh, names and what their teams are doing and who's competing the race. 
and the race was Whoa. to complete the training program and not leave it in between and get the certificate for it. Where did this leaderboard sit? Was it public just in the leader space and for the whole organization? Whole organization. Because I, I you know, I, there was an aha moment for me and I, I really cherish that moment. Okay? Yeah. So uh, I and my team member, we made this board and we published this and it was there on the screens of all the monitors, uh, all the TV screens, LCD screens across the floor for 600 people to see. Wow. <laughs> uh, it was monthly published and we used to send a mail or two and then it, in the pantry area and all we used to put like a little bit of boards that oh, yeah. okay, everyone gets to who's scoring what. And you know, it's very interesting to say, even if I've not done a course, oh, you know what, my team is best in learning. Yeah. So, you know, and this pride which comes up with every leader. But my aha moment was when one of the person, when we published the board, within like five minutes, I get amazed. And this person's writing, you know what, the statistics are incorrect. And you're looking at uh, like one team member has, one leader has 20 members, other team leader has like 60 members. How can you talk in absolute numbers like 10, 10 people have done versus 40 people? We will always be low. You have to come to percentages. You have to do this. My team is going low. I have done so much. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, wow, I love this. Yeah. This person is in the game element. He wants to win. <laughs> you know? And instead of getting agitated and angry that, oh, yeah, we have to change the metric, I was so happy. And my team members looking at me, you know, now she's he said that. It's not fair. I'm like, Hang on, you're not realizing that our gamification and branding is working. Yeah, wow. But people are fighting with each other that I need to score better. You change <laughs> this metric. I was blown away. I was so happy that day. I was like, okay, let's change the metric. That doesn't matter. Yeah. We can come to percentages on that. And we had a couple of metrics on this. But the, the leaderboard had a black background with a couple of neon color, you know, stuff. And I think it's, it's all about beautification of it. Yeah. But that really created that adrenal rush. We moved from close to 15% to 35% complete, or 35 completion rate in just two, three months, yeah. which was like big. We're talking about 600 plus people, like, you know, 35% people have completed a course. Yeah. Wow. So yeah, I think I, first is branding through gamification. Yep. Second one, we had learning banners, like the entire year's calendar in a learning banner. And that Sandy was put up on like all the places where there's high footfall, whether it's the entry or the exit or the pantry yep. or all of that. So high I, visibility of what's available. Yeah. So not having to go look for it in an intranet or something. It's Nothing just there only. when you're getting your cup of tea. I know you, we're, you know, we're so much in the digital world. I don't want to open and see, oh my God, which program's coming. I look at the banner and when, when I'm going for coffee and when I'm entering and, I'm, you know, maybe signing or whatever, you know, in case I have to sign something for an entry and I'll just see, okay, this month, this is it. Okay, fine, that's it. Yeah. And wow. I know what exact dates can be figured out, but I know this program I want to take or not take. Yeah. And I'm not talking about functional learning. I'm talking about professional development. I'm talking about leadership learning, even to the executive level. Yeah. So make it easy, make it like branding material there on the banners. And, uh, you know, third, I think everyone is using, but in the pantry area is a bit of what's coming up with exact schedule, and especially yeah. uh, placing it where, you know, you water dispensers are there when you're filling the water or preparing your tea, like a little thing, okay. Beyond the trainings, this learning journey is coming up, this campus refresher, when you're hiring people from campus, you have a bit of a, ga you know, gamified version of, they present and then they win and and then they come inside. So all of that coming up. Oh, I can present here, here, here. So yeah, yeah. you get to know what's happening. That's cool. Very cool. Uh, you mentioned when we were talking earlier about accelerated learning. And <laughs> I'm <thinking laughs> like, light up now. <laughs> so when you said it to me, I actually hadn't really heard of it, to be honest. I, well, I don't think I know what it is. And you said it... Well, I was talking about my passion for instructional design and then you were like, oh my God, you have to like look at accelerated learning because it's like the, it's bigger than ID. It's like the next level up. And so I went to Google and then I saw a Tim Ferriss like a uh, video on accelerated learning and then all these other people and I was like, whoa, like, okay, I'm, this is, I'm going to get too far into the internet and not get any work done. So can you please like share and help like, yeah, I want to be curious and understand what is accelerated learning and why is it, why should I care? 
So Kim, accelerated learning, honestly, I got certified last year. Yeah. Uh, I think third quarter of last year. But I saw the first, I went for a breakfast conference and I saw the first promo almost one and a half year back. Yeah. And since one and a half year, all I was thinking was, this is phenomenal work. How do I get my learning community of practice be certified of this? Yeah. Because I know it will be so impactful. It will be just out of the world. And I obviously, I was, I wanted to get certified in this as well. <laughs> so it was a journey to get those funds, to get my people certified in it. But I think every penny is worth it. Yeah. And just to talk a little bit more about accelerated learning, it has uh, broadly three categories and seven plus one plus one principle. Uh, maybe I'm just fiddle out on numbers, maybe one or two principles, but broad principle at all. Yeah. It's about not pushing the content. It's not training, it's facilitation. Mm -hmm. right? That means if I'm telling you something, that's training. Facilitation, that means you are kind of, I'm facilitating, helping you get the content. Yeah. Right? Basic principle. Number two, I do not uh, create the content. Uh, like, I, I don't want you to consume the content the way I'm creating and giving it to you. I want you to create the content. So when you create the content, but I smartly facilitate for, so that you think and you create the content, you'll remember. Because researchers have said that you eventually remember what you said in the training program <laughs> as a participant. And it's not about the facilitator, it is totally about the participant. Third, it is about, you know, fun and collaborative, enjoyable based learning. You know, that's yeah. it. It further has the four Ps. Now, instructional design has exactly the four Ps, but how ID and AL are different, it's about in the preparation phase, it's about arousing interest. Like, you know, maybe sending a little snippet of something which is coming up. Yeah. In the presentation phase, I will not think about how can I push this content to you. I can think about how can I help you encounter the content and create that content. Wow. Then in the practice phase, of course, you practice the way you do. And then eventually it is about, uh, you know, the last P where you kind of retain and can, you know, continue with it. Beyond this, it keep, keeps in mind the adult learning principle now, uh, why the auditory and visual are seen. Yeah. Instead of kinesthetic, it has somatic and one more, which I'm forgetting. What's so, somatic? So uh, it is intellectual and somatic learning, two learning styles. Okay. So intellectual is people who are thinking. Yeah. And somatic is just like kinesthetic, like, you know, working out, okay. standing and doing stuff. Yeah. But they've divided only kinesthetic to a somatic and an intellectual. Yeah. Now, uh, the good news about this framework is when in the 4P model, I think about, I want people to learn these three things. I put that in the presentation. Yeah. Then I'll think about my learner types and everything. Then I'll think about activities. How, what is the 4P for every topic? And against that, what are activities and planning? Is it for all the four learners? I do tick yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Yeah. Is it individual versus class? Yes, no, yes, no, yes, no. Is it facilitator? Was this presenter? Is it creator versus curator? So all of that. So your Excel sheet gives a very holistic picture of your learning design. Now, ID doesn't talk about, you know, seeing whether every activity is aligned to learner style. And is it that, you know, what usually happens, I'm more of a kinesthetic one. I will want everything to be kinesthetic in my learning. What happens to the auditory and the visual ones? And the intellectual ones will say, oh my God, it was so <laughs> irritating. <laughs> so it has to be a very good balance. Yeah. So AL does that. Beyond that, AL also says, are you pleasing the five senses? Is the smell good? Is the taste good? Do you have candies there? Or do you have music there? Is the touch good of whatever little, you know, calendars and other materials that you're creating? Yeah, wow. Yeah. Is it good for my eyes? Is it colorful around here? Why is, is this important? Because I think whenever we're learning, all the five senses, when they're engaged, we are, uh, we feel good and we enjoy the learning space. And that's how we are, you know, generally. Yeah. The last bit of AL is getting your whole body to learn, right? So having activities where your entire body is engaged. That's What's an example? <laughs> I was picture like star jumps <laughs> learning the ABCs or something. So, so, you know, it can be like on this carpet, you know, I just put, and it's a very good example which I had uh, in the AL space I learned, was that 
a company had to teach people in the entire flowchart way of doing some particular thing. Yeah. Now remembering flowcharts and all is good in college when you had to cram and get the the number yeah. <laughs> in the exam. But doing that, okay, a flowchart, okay, you draw this, it can be very monotonous. Yeah. So what we did is we had the inputs of all the flowcharts kept here and there on the carpet. Yeah. And people had to, and when there was a design of the flowchart here that this is coming here, this is coming here, but you had to kind of mix and match and find out. So everyone stood up and then they were like all over fixing it up talking about it yeah and then the presentation was a and b team did that and a team will say i'm here i start from here so i start as in not the paper i am the start of the yeah. chart yeah physically my body and then i moved on to the end button one person is the end one is at the start and in between people go from here and there so it's my whole body is becoming the flow chart and going there that's and versus the other team and then you you really say oh you know what you messed up here the flow chart is like this in that process because you've done it you remember it yeah instead of i drawing and saying okay flow chart here yeah. mm. another example is have a relay race of ideas <laughs> we teach a topic and we say okay now how will you implement as five member team you come have to come up with maximum ideas we say okay yeah, yeah, yeah. these are my ideas okay and then two teams are there in the relay race form yeah. they will stand there will be a chart board you have to basically run there on the chart board and then you have to put in your idea and then go back give like a like high five and the next person will run it yeah so the team which gets the maximum ideas wins right and maximum ideas in the form of visual auditory or whatever way you want to put it so that's again whole body learning with ideation and then practice from there and getting to know the ideas so in this format when you kind of creating and you winning and this gamification there's a lot more of learning. Now, AI style, which I also practice, which I was taught, is my genie. Oh my goodness. And this genie is very cute. By the way, I have a genie at home. Uh, <laughs> I could have brought it for you, actually, but my purse is too small. <laughs> so, and the genie is very big. <laughs> so what happens with the genie is you put the genie on the wall and, you know, you can say, what are your wishes to the genie for the next workshop? Is there anything wishes to the genie for now, which the genie can think? Yeah. And I remember one of the guys said, hey, Jeannie, I want uh, $50,000. Can I get it? Yeah. Jeannie said, no, sorry, no financial help here. <laughs> <laughs> so basically, Jeannie is the facilitator. You know, yeah. people are talking to the Jeannie that way. Then Ian also talks about uh, like a sticky wall with Facebook and collaborative learning with likes. So it's a collaborative yeah, yeah. work. You put in the ideas there, or whatever learning ideas, closing ideas, people. And whoever likes, you kind of put a Facebook like there. And everyone wants to say, oh, my idea has got good Facebook likes or not. <laughs> yeah, definitely. We can all relate to the notifications on our phone. But it's all happening in the physical world. Yeah. Now, AL style, I have learned it in the physical world format, which I believe is, is more interesting. It can always be, you know, the, tool, the tools and the practices can be replicated to the e-learning space. I do yeah. understand a lot of companies... And your company is also working a lot on e-learning and gamification. Yeah. And in my organ last organization also, we witnessed like the entire learning journey where collaboration across the world and all yeah. of that's happening. Now, these tools can be used in that space, but I've tried it in the physical environment and it's, it's just blown away yeah. uh, the learners, you know, to a next level. <laughs> that's cool. It, it makes me think, um, so we recently did learning about universal design language so we've wow. got a blog series coming out and one of the things which i like about the accelerated learning and udl universal design language is that facilitation don't train or teach help them and so in the online space what that can look like is you know there might be a social media policy that people need to read before in their onboarding or in their induction or other policies but it's not about, you know, go and read this document and click the link and open it. It's about facilitating learning to say, look, all of this kind of information, policies, directives, they sit on our intranet. We'll help you get you to the intranet to search one of them and you can read it. But for everything else you want to know, like whether how much leave am I entitled to or how do I put in this kind of request, a sick leave thing you now know that you can go search for it on the internet the same way that you just did for looking up the tasks that we gave you or the quest there. So I think there's ways like that that we can do it where we 
are not just information overload dumping everything but we just say hey if you're curious to learn more this is what we recommend and go off on your own journey and facilitate that way i think that is clever and that is the next big thing because there's so much content out there if you can yeah. give those micro nuggets like we call it the momo learning like you know you dim sim like you know you got the dim sim yeah. <laughs> so you you can have that learning and you know a bit of snippet like 10 lines on this is it and this is the crux but like this is a promo maybe you can yeah. go there yeah yeah absolutely because no one has the time to see the full movie everyone wants to see the trailer and see whether it's worth our time that's so true oh, how do you have that conversation with stakeholders cuz oh sorry like the subject matter experts yeah. more so i shouldn't label them <laughs> um because they want to give you the full movie but really a lot of the time that's what's necessary is just the trailer for the majority so you know that's why to know like the trailer it is about your knowledge and skill that you you will learn after the workshop Yeah. So in a way that's the trailer and that's why the first thing we did was the foundation right having the knowledge and skill there for this particular workshop there's a the knowledge and skill for a leadership workshop it will be like you know you will develop this this is the objectives very clear yeah and that in a way about it while it's a very text heavy trailer i want it to be a movie format <laughs> but, but it's still a trailer yeah. and you will not be disappointed when you come inside the workshop because it's about you know achieving those learning objectives and it's if you think about it it's very simple everyone's doing it but are the learning objectives and the workshop aligned 90% of the time that's not aligned mm-hmm. you say something but in reality something else is happening because maybe the learner expectation was not clear because they didn't see the objectives or the TNI was incorrect but if you are al- aligned in terms of what you're trying to achieve and you achieve that and if people read that i think the problem is solved yeah okay cool Um one other thing that was on my Google list <laughs> was theater pedagogy. What the hell is that? <laughs> okay, can Are you a me? drama queen? <laughs> I am certainly a drama queen. I am a drama and I think that's that's the next big thing in the learning space and I want to bring that to Australia. Yeah. <laughs> so, uh Kim Theta pedagogy is something Wait, which, are you a Bollywood star that I should know about? No, I wish I was. Oh, really? <laughs> I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> not yet. <laughs> not yet. Why, well, you know, I get weird dreams when few of the Bollywood stars they come in my dreams. I don't know why they're coming, but it's okay. Oh, wow. <laughs> Maybe it's a premonition. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. They've been thinking about me for a while. <laughs> <laughs> so, um Theta pedagogy is something which is the closest to my heart. Yeah. You know, beyond the AL, beyond everything. And this is my, it's been my own journey mm-hmm. without any of my employers in space. But yes, they were really kind for me to implement my skills there and add value. But how it started as a journey was that there's an institute uh, way back where in Bangalore where I got certified there. And they train teachers in the schools. to teach kids and hence for pedagogy mm. on learning stuff through theater and when we say of theater what what does come to your mind when you think of theater as a word theater like a stage with a show going on yes. it's very dramatized <laughs> i'm not that entertained by it but <laughs> i'm sorry but i think 90% of the people when they think of theater they think of exactly this a drama yeah. a movie yeah in reality theater is everything which is an alternate pedagogy right it's about painting it's about music mm. it's about puppetry it's about uh jingles it's it's about anything which is alternate right so when i thought of theta and i said okay it's drama maybe i'll see some drama i'll just be an actor for a while but i was so wrong yeah and slowly i i went to that workshop for teachers and in my free time on the weekends i said okay let me just see this I never thought that I implemented in, you know, corporate and I was just doing all of this for fun. Yeah. But suddenly it meant business to me. <laughs> <laughs> so they were teaching teachers that how can you use all of this? Like how can you use body movements to create a message? Really body movements to create a message? I was like what are they talking? <laughs> I was just not getting it. Uh, how do you use group freeze? Suddenly everyone freezes. And then the emotions come out and one person starts talking, everyone becomes a good listener. and it's like a statue game we yeah. play as kids yeah we never thought all of this can help in learning and by the day and it was almost one and a half year journey every weekend or maybe alternate weekend i was just amazed what's happening 
and then I realized it is painting, it is music, it is a drama, it is intimate interactive theater, it is puppetry, it is a lot more than what I think it was. Yeah, wow. And then I said, okay, I want to implement this in nuggets at my workplace. And you know, uh, I think that's it's. I, I was blessed to work in global companies which have an innovative potential mm. and appetite to allow different things. And it was a hit because I tried that in an induction format where everyone is in a circle time format, like standing in circle. And then slowly one person used to come in and you know talk and that circle. And I used to have flavors in the circle and all of that to start with. Then I did something on uh, painting where you know everyone had to paint something and then and that theme of painting was around what is the employee value proposition that your company gets in for you and or maybe in a subtle way what are the two things you have had the best moments in your organization and from there you got, got to know like 50 plus people yeah two two moments 100 moments out there then you can bucket the moments into the themes whether it's recognition that people are liking or whether it's you know the work-life balance what is it that people are like from there you're really carving out the evp instead of one HR person manager sitting there saying, oh, in the VOE, people have said this. I think we are just a good paymaster. That's why people are here. Oh, we are a global brand. No, the EVP is coming from the paintings. Mm. And you don't tell people, okay, now tell me what is the EVP for my company. Employee say value. what an EVP is. Can Employee you value proposition. Yeah. Why okay. do you want to work for us? Yeah. So with painting, you got it so easily. And I was like, wow, okay, that's good. People were like, oh, this was interesting. Then we are talking about our organization's value you know, the values that we care for and, uh, you know, the behaviors that we want people to see. And we had this little competition of, you know, create an act and drama, you know, to showcase the values. And there were, there were people in different teams and they were competing. And then the best person who sh shares all the values, like the best act gets an award. In that way, people started thinking about the values. Mm. You know, who wins doesn't matter. What was the act doesn't matter. But people have imbibed that, they've thought of the story. And that's in, in, in subtly they've learned that, you yeah. know, through drama. Then we were doing something on change management, which was one of my favorites. And, you know, that's something which has got like close to 300 plus likes on LinkedIn with 2,000 plus views. And we got yeah. a bronze award in my last organization there. The problem statement was that um, people were leaving, they were disengaged because a lot of uh, central level policies were changing, uh, commitments given to them with global travel, etc. was not uh, holding true and obviously there were coffee chats saying that how frustrating it is to be here and I want to leave and maybe give me a resume <laughs> and I'll post yeah. it everywhere and everything in my network. Now moving those people from a negative state to a positive state, how do you do that? Do you call them in the room and say, oh I know you all are negative? We four hours, <laughs> let's be positive and that's it. Yeah. Or maybe sending them in a training program where someone just talks and everyone says, okay, can I have lunch please? So <laughs> you don't want that. Yeah. So we did that through a very different methodology called as puppetry. We had their story with their leader, with people who wanted to kind of work with this leader and who were promoters, had their story carved out. We made a puppet. We had a puppet show and shared how this person had moved from a A state to a B state and otherwise the other person from A state may be getting stuck to that A state. Mm. And that entire journey through an entire global model, you know, uh, it's, it's one of the models in chain management called as a transition model. Change is an event where transition is entire journey in my mind. Change is an event that I move from a country X to a country Y. Transition in my mind, am I have I adapted to a country Y or am I still getting stuck on my little bit of country A emotions yeah. and where I was yeah. in my career? But it change can happen by taking a flight, but transition might take its months and years. Yeah. So how do I move people from here to here? We had a puppetry act, we had a story, we had a little bit of content on what it is, and then suddenly when people were thinking how will I implement this content? It's a surprise and boom. We hear the puppetry act and it was like, oh, what's happening? And my people are doing this thing. And, and suddenly, you know, we eventually gave this puppet name for a global connect because we got a request that it was such a hit that global teams wants it. Yeah. And of course, the stakeholder was a major guy who kind of convinced and who made the branding out of it. Yeah. He was a good branding guy. <laughs> he is a good branding guy. And was like a biggest promoter of LD and we really partnered well. So, 
eventually, you know, we made this character very, uh, a character which everyone could relate to, yeah. a very neutral character, so that you don't feel that I've deliberately made the name of the character Kim, so Kim will feel, oh, I, is she trying to get a point yeah, with yeah. her, you know. So we made the character name as Sheldon Cooper. <laughs> Sheldon is getting stuck on Sheldon's seat. Okay, this is my seat. I want to be here and you don't take my spot away. And then there's Penny who is becoming Sheldon's... Uh, oh, Penny was the manager. Yeah, I think Penny was the manager. Or, you know, the characters of uh, Big Bang coming yeah. into play. And one is becoming a friend. One is becoming a new manager. One is becoming a new colleague. <laughs> and, you know, how Sheldon moved from one role to another. And how... Sheldon needs those counseling to say that, you know what, you're getting reskilled, otherwise your manager's gone. So uh, Rajesh Kuntrapalli was the manager. <laughs> <laughs> Sheldon liked his manager, but unfortunately the manager uh, was now Penny. So, so yeah, in that space, when we did that act and everything closed, suddenly it became a joke. And that's what we want people to think. It was a joke that, hey, you're getting stuck in the ending phase. Oh, don't get stuck. Come on, let's move on. Let me help you. Let me coach you. Yeah. And that slowly that negative emotion moved to a positive emotion. It could have never happened through a training program. Please move from a negative to a positive. It can always happen in a very immersive learning. And henceforth, theatre pedagogy is one of my best. And I want really to bring that to Australia. That's really cool. This has been a fascinating discussion. Thank you so much. Um, I have one more question for you, but before that, how can people find you or connect with you online? So uh, I'm really available, very active on LinkedIn, and uh, my full name is Divya Dhir, so D-I-V-Y-A-D-H-I-R. Yep. You can really connect with me on LinkedIn. And of course, if you want to see Sheldon Cooper in action, <laughs> I have a little video on a precursor to puppetry available there. Uh, you can absolutely have a look. Um, I'm, I'm open for puppetry-based stuff. <laughs> I'm exploring the Australian market, being Australia savvy, meeting and connecting with people, seeing what's hot in this market. Yeah. And that's how I connected with you, Kim. I was really blessed to have that opportunity. And I would love to stay connected and see how I can add value and you know, make Australia more theatre savvy. <laughs> yeah, well, I think you have a lot to offer. And so my last question for you is, you've come from a very, I would say, proactive L&D space. How can you, what advice do you have for people that are sitting in a reactive L&D team or how they're viewed by their organisation? How can they, in the next six to 12 months, start positioning or moving towards a proactive um, Place. Kim, I think it's a journey, but I'll, I'll share one golden rule which I really follow. And I want to thank my leaders in the learning space, people who are heading L&D, yeah. uh, my mentors and leaders. They always taught me one thing. And I think my last employer really invested a lot in me and I, I would like to thank them for it. But they taught me one thing. We are a learning professional. We talk about people to build their skills, right? Yeah. Uh, we say build three functional, two professional development or leadership skills every year. So five skills a year. As a learning leader, what skills are you building? Most of us, you know, do our, you know, bachelors and masters and we become learning professionals. We do a certificate for, we do ID and, you know, and then we feel, okay, you know what, I'm a like everyone else, I'm a learning leader. What is your USP? Maybe I've worked in this sector and this sector. But really think about it. What is your USP mm -hmm. as a learning professional? And what are the certifications you want to pick? I, I from the last three, four years, since my like core L&D role, I've picked two certifications every year. Yeah. I've done theta pedagogy. I've done, you know, accelerated learning. I also did instructional design. I got, you know, certified as a facilitator. I've done assessment center. I've done, recently I've done reach profile. It's very interesting to do, you know, psychometric assessment. I've done emotional intelligence by Colin Ferry. But all of that, all of this in three and a half year journey. So in the next six to eight months, every learning professional beyond attending the RE conferences and you know ODI conferences and I, IPL conferences, which we all would love to connect and learn, pick a skill, pick maybe AL, pick, pick anything in L&D, which it can be an article in 360. Yeah. Pick one skill, one certification. Even if you don't get a short-term opportunity to implement it, it's fine. Have your entire you know, portfolio work ready. Pick two skills a year. And I'm sure if you pick a skill this time, maybe not in the next six months, but next one year, you will get an opportunity to implement it. 
and of course you know beyond the education continue the experience and exposure journey because it is a journey i mean i was not what i was three and a half years back and i thank myself three and a half years back <laughs> that thank god that i got those leaders who told me you know please invest in yourself yeah wow well. before investing in anyone else. Well, wow. so that's the only advice I have for everyone in the learning field. <laughs> <laughs> well, Divya, thank you so much for this discussion. It's really added value to me and I'm sure it has added a lot of value to the listeners. So, thank you. Thank you so much, Kim, and wishing you and the team all the best and thank you for having me here. It's a pleasure talking and would love to stay connected forever. <laughs> yeah, of course, definitely. Thank you everyone for listening. Uh, we really appreciate you. Yeah, I hopefully this has added value. It definitely added value to me and we will continue doing these podcasts and recordings on things such as the L&D space, instructional design and e-learning. So have an awesome day.